nobody does Tesla news on Saturday. Every day, Monday through Friday, you can get great news reporting from uh, Tesla Daily, Rob Maurer. You can get uh, Dylan over there on Electrify giving you fantastic news five days a week, but nobody gives you the news on Saturday. So I am going to fill that void, at least for this Saturday. And if you like that idea, would you hit the like button and uh, subscribe, notify, all that jazz. And uh, of course, I'm still looking for some more folks to join my Patreon. Uh, so let's dig right into the news that you've probably not seen anywhere else. That's going to be the goal of this particular Saturday deal. I'm going to try to bring you stuff that nobody else reported on all week and that probably they're unlikely to ever report on because they don't report again until next week. Now, Lars, he reports on Sunday, and maybe he'll hit a couple of these items, especially if he watches this video. And go ahead, Lars. I'm, you know, thank you for helping me with the book. And uh, if any one of these news stories seems like it'd be great on your show, go for it. I love it. All right. So let's talk about the news. Let's start with Sandy Monroe, who did an interview with the CEO of Polestar. Um, now, it turns out that Polestar has a very different approach from Tesla with regard to how they see their future. They consider to see, like Volvo, like some of the other Geely brands, they continue to see themselves as being a niche product, meaning, you know, maybe a million or two million cars a year would be fine for them. They are not looking to be a mass market producer. They're looking to be a, you know, top of the line, uh, you know, upper middle class uh, product. Um, and so therefore, they're not doing some of the same kinds of things that Tesla would necessarily do uh, to get uh, market share. They're going to concentrate on design. They're going to concentrate on, you know, making the thing luxurious um, and uh, not so much in terms of being the greatest manufacturer in the world, et cetera, like Tesla does. Anyway, um, this uh, particular interview gets way into the weeds. Uh, but if you like getting into the weeds, I, it, and if you like listening to Sandy Monroe, uh, I would highly recommend this uh, interview, and I put it uh, in the link below. Um, coming out a couple of days ago was the IEA annual report. Um, I'll link that down below as well. Now, the IEA, when they make predictions about the future with regard to electrification, with regard to BEV sales, with regard to batteries, uh, you know, um, pricing, any any of these predictions that they've been making over the years, Tony Sieb is always pointing out, they are so wrong. I mean, they, they, they couldn't be more wrong if they, you know, were blindfolded when they threw the dart. <laughs> That's just sad. And they're always extremely conservative. They're generally taking a linear view of what the future is going to look like rather than a disruptive uh, S-shaped curve. Uh, so as a result, they just end up being wrong over and over and over again. But anyway, let's take a look at a couple of things that they said. Um, they did indicate, this is kind of interesting for your friends who are still worried that, that the global warming situation is apocalyptic. Uh, the IEA seems to believe now that the technology that we have in, uh, in line and that we're in, deploying rather rapidly, that this is really going to be enough. It just needs to keep on going. There's a few things they'd like to see happen a little faster. Uh, but uh, again, you could take a look at the report yourself and see what those are. But let's let's face it, they agree that uh, the uh, uh, vehicles uh, going over to uh, electric and the grid going to electric, those are the two biggies. And if those two things happen at the rate they appear, they're going to happen which is slower than the rate that I think they're going to happen, well, then everything's going to be tickety-boo. We'll stay under 1.5 degrees uh, just uh, by doing that. And they do have one other uh, requirement, and that is getting the deforestation down to a net zero. So uh, to the extent that we're taking away forest, we need to add forest elsewhere. I think actually we've been adding forest faster at this point than we are reducing. I believe that's true. So the 2030 goals uh, for the BEVs and solar wind battery, uh, we're almost certainly going to exceed those. They're only looking at 61 million new BEVs in 2030. Uh, that 61 number I see being hit in 2026. I have a video uh, that I'll, I'll post down below where you can go take a look at my specific by factory, what I believe can be done 
in most cases, you know, factories like GM only need to do 3 million, Ford 3 million, um, you know, Geely a few more, but I, there, I don't see any reason why we can't get to 65 million by 2026 and then completely eliminate the ice age by 2027. Uh, there are only showing 400,000 uh, class eight, you know, large trucks, 400,000 worldwide out of 4 million being built. They're su suggesting that 3.6 million diesel vehicles will still be being produced each year. I think that is nuts. I think Tesla will be doing, I, you, you probably know from previous videos, I think Tesla will be doing a million uh, large trucks by 2030. Uh, and I think the other manufacturers, truck manufacturers will have switched very, very, uh, uh, maybe not as rapidly as we'd like them to, but the huge percentage of the trucks sold in 2030 will be BEV, probably well more than 50%. Um, the uh, IEA numbers um, are also talking about, uh, let's see, wait a minute, solar wind deployments. They're only saying that the solar and wind deployments will be one terawatt. Uh, by 2030 that year. In other words, just additional deployments in 2030. I think that number is really super low. I think they're basing it on the fact of where deployments have been. And even though they've been accelerating, um, I think that they, I, I, I can't believe they haven't done the homework, but the homework I've done says that the reason deployments haven't been faster is because there haven't been enough batteries. And now there's gonna be enough batteries. Uh, Elon Musk is his own personal goal is one terawatt hour of energy storage uh, being deployed uh, you know, by 2030, which would be plenty enough to do way more than terawatt deployed in 2030. So I think they'll blow that number out of the, out of the, uh, uh, out of the water. Also, the IEA said they don't see any issues with material uh, uh, in, in the future. Now, they're basing that, of course, on their uh, their theory that it's only 61 million BEVs and only 400,000 trucks um, in 2030. So maybe if they were really thinking that it was uh, 85 million cars and 3 million trucks by 2030, they might think that there's going to be some battery or lithium or whatever shortages. I'm, I don't have a crystal, I don't have enough understanding of the data that they're using to know if that would be the case. I particularly have come to the conclusion based on a massive amount of research um, that no, uh, maybe there'll be a year, not next year. And I don't think in 2025, maybe 2026 or 2027, when the ramp is really hitting uh, in a major way, maybe there could be some battery or lithium or, or, or lithium refining problems. But by and large, no, it looks like there's gonna be plenty of product. All right, so news, next news. Elon was on the Bill Maher show, Maher show last night. Uh, if you didn't see it, you go on YouTube. It's 15 different people have that there. You can you can check it out. Um, it was interesting. But the most interesting thing of the night, because most of what he says, you've heard him say a million times. Um, I certainly have. Uh, what was interesting was this was clearly a Joe Biden loving audience. Uh, every comment that was made about Joe Biden got a tremendous amount of applause. But then Elon got a tremendous amount of applause from that same audience, and it seemed genuine. They seemed to really like what he was saying. That was good to see. So anyway, that might be worth look, taking a look at. Um, next was, uh, there was a great interview. If you love the robotic stuff, if you love the, the Optimus future, if you've been watching all of our videos on Optimus, and if you haven't, they are still absolutely timely. All There's six, seven, eight videos that if you haven't seen them, uh, you want to go back and take a look. Um, anyway, uh, he, uh, if you don't watch Lex Friedman interviews, <laughs> wow, this stuff is so great. Anyway, he interviewed the uh, CEO of Boston Dynamics, Robert Plater. You know, the Boston Dynamics, those are the robots that do front flips and back flips and jump up onto things and run in place. And they have the dog that does. Anyway, you've been watching these for many, many years. So the interview, you know, talks about the founding of Boston Dynamics, about all their early DARPA contracts, um, and then some of the huge breakthroughs they've had with regard to things like getting a, a robot to jump or do flips. Um, anyway, but the, the news that I thought came out of it, <laughs> maybe you'll think that I'm just narrow focused on this particular part of the news, but he says the only way that any company, including them, 
are going to get to the place where they have useful robots. And he talked uh, all about deployment in manufacturing. That's where he sees the opportunity for Boston Dynamics. He wants useful robots that can be deployed in industry. And he said, you need a thousand robots out there that are doing useful things and learning. And then the entire the entire uh, group of robots learn. Um, I don't know who else has been saying that. <laughs> Have you been on any channels where there's been any guy um, you know, who likes to wear Hawaiian shirts, maybe that has been talking about you need a thousand robots doing lots of useful things 24 hours a day with helpers. Um, yeah, I think that that's what Tesla is doing right now. I've been saying that uh, for about five months. Um, and some people laugh at me, but I've had uh, quite a few experts on my show that agree with me. I'm going to add the uh, <laughs> Robert Plater of uh, Boston Dynamics as saying they need a thousand robots doing useful tasks so that they can get the learning taking place quickly. He also said that at Boston Dynamics, you will see the uh, uh, bi bipedal uh, humanoid robots, and you will also see the quadruped uh, dogs walking around aimlessly. <laughs> well, not totally aimlessly, but you'll see them walking the halls and walking the offices over at Boston Dynamics all day long, all night long, because they're in training. I Again, I can't imagine... Uh, what kind of a channel you could watch that would say such crazy things. Oh, maybe this one. Anyway, okay. Uh, video uh, is linked down below for the uh, Lex Friedman uh, interview. Um, so anyway, is, is, is this good stuff? Are you liking this? Good time to hit the like button if, this, if you think you'd like to see this every Saturday. But there's way more, so don't go away. All right. Um, now, I did a poll in, among the Tesla community on Twitter and what I wondered was uh, how RoboTaxi might change the car ownership picture in the future. So, you know, if you could get a RoboTaxi, if you could have a RoboTaxi at your house in 10 minutes or five minutes, and it would take you anywhere you wanted to for a buck on a mile or a half a buck a mile or 25 cents a mile, which is the uh, uh, eventual goal, um, would that change the layout? Would it change how many cars you have in the house? So 20% um, said that they would own no car. No, they would just use robotaxis. They would be thrilled to be out of the owning and garaging and washing and maintaining, paying insurance on, et cetera, cars. They would be, they'd be out of cars, no cars. 40% said that if they had two cars, they would reduce it to one. That's what we would be doing in the Kirk household. We'd be reducing, keeping our Tesla, getting rid of our Volvo. We'd be down to one car. Um, and then um, about the other 40%, of course, which is what's the, the, um, the remaining amount, said no, no change in how they would do things. And I had a lot of comments, a lot of people talking about, well, you know, I'm out in the rural area. I, I can't, there's no way the robotaxi is going to help me. Um, I'm always putting a car seat in and out. I'm not going to keep doing that all. You know, every time I get a, a, in a robotaxi, I got to put it in, take it out. So I can think of multiple use cases like that. Can you think of some? Put them in the comments below of why you might not ever be a 100% uh, robotaxi house or where you might not even drop down to one car with the rest of your uh, activity being done with a robotaxi when two people or more are going in different directions. All right. So that's uh, next news content. content. Brian White reported from the fully charged, that's Brian White, My Tesla Weekend. Um, he reported from the fully charged show in London. It was terrible reception. That's why I'm not doing it live right now with you. That was our intent, but the, we, we, the Wi-Fi was horrible. So it just, it was not good. But he said the most interesting thing he saw there yesterday was that the uh, Shell Oil uh, is uh, in the business of manufacturing and, in, and installing um, chargers. Um, and uh, he didn't. We didn't go into a lot of detail of the kind of chargers that they're doing. But one of the ones they are doing is they're installing them in lamp posts in London, and they've already got. I forget whether it was hundreds or thousands, uh, but a, a significant number. I want to say seven hundred already installed in lamp posts in London. Didn't talk about how fast they charge or anything else, but just interesting that Shell Oil is in that business. It looked as if looking at the booth, it looked like they also have some that might be deployed in uh, restaurants or deployed in homes or, or uh, parking lots for, for um, mass in, uh, in uh, you know, large shopping centers and whatnot. Anyway, uh, that was, uh, I thought, an interesting piece of news. Geely has just reduced the cost of their radar RD6 small electric pickup truck to 
$20,300. Now this is a short bed. It is a, it is a kind of a lifestyle pickup truck, uh, you know, kind of a station wagon without a cover. Um, you know, it's not a big, big old truck, but $20,300. Um, this was reported on, on uh, uh, the electric Viking. Um, and uh, he was talking about the fact that, you know, even if you increase this cost, uh, by shipping it and then paying import duties or whatever. He's in Australia. So he was saying it might end up costing the equivalent of $34,000 American um, in uh, our 30, I think he says that's like 40, or close to 50,000 Australian. Anyway, um, it would still be a deal. It would still be a very saleable truck. So I've been looking at that particular part of the truck business too, and thinking that Tesla will be using their new um, generation, third generation uh, platform to do some kind of a small truck, maybe even smaller than this RD6 uh, truck. Um, and th there would also be a potential, I think, for maybe using the, the Model 3 platform uh, to do this size truck, or maybe even a little larger with a slightly more work-oriented opportunity. Anyway, I, I, I think there's got to be way more pickup trucks coming out uh, in the electric uh, world. But Geely has definitely set the pace with a truck that in China is now only $20,300. That's, I thought, fascinating. Last piece of news is that uh, Meet Kevin did an interview with Gary Black. You can see it. I'll put the information below. Uh, he met with Gary Black and he wanted to talk to him about, you know, some of the things Gary Black's been saying recently. Well, here's what I took away from the from the video. Uh, you may still want to take a look at it, but because uh, it's that it's an hour and a half long and uh, I thought this was the important part. Um, number one, um, he is uh, continuing to be shocked by the fact that the margins went under 20 and it caused him to, he had already reduced his position prior to the earnings uh, call um, and he has not increased his position since, but he st it's still his number two position. Still loves Tesla and believes it has an amazing future. Still has a price um, uh, goal, a uh, short-term price goal of three, I want to say 335, 325, somewhere in that range. I, I should have marked it down. I didn't, uh, but it's in that, it's in that ballpark, which is very similar to mine. I'm saying 300 by the third quarter or so, and then going towards 400 by the end of the year, based on the market going up, not just Tesla's performance, but also the market going up. But he sees Cybertruck, he sees uh, the the um, the new you know, generation three platform. All of these things he sees as being great opportunities for Tesla. He did mention energy as well. Now, uh, six months ago, five months ago, four months ago, when I was talking about energy, Gary was he, he knew nothing about energy. So we have made some progress there. Um, so anyway, the the reality is though uh, he sees uh, a much smaller a future for Tesla than I do. And so he's only looking at this 335. I see Tesla maybe at double uh, everything that he's talking about. And he sees absolutely no future. He says uh, he doesn't think that the idea of a robotaxi network is ever going to happen. So you can see why he's only at 335 uh, and maybe why his position has dropped to, to number two. Um, so anyway, uh, let's see, I, I was thinking, oh, yes, he also said that he thought that margins could drop this year as low as 15%, maybe 16%. Um, I don't think that's going to happen at all. I did an entire video on that. I'll put that information below. Uh, I think the uh, they've gone as low as they're going to go on the margins. In fact, I think the margins will continue to expand the rest of the year, both because the cost of goods will go down, the cost of transportation will go down. The cost of uh, 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 of the overhead will go down. I mean, everything is going to go down um, with regard to costs, and I believe that they will have price increases as we see the year going forward because the prices right now are plenty low enough. I Gary was also concerned that there was not more uptake since the prices went down. Why are people rushing to buy? Well, it's only been a few weeks. It takes a while for that kind of information to get to the public. So take a look at that video that I did uh, uh, earlier, and I've, I got that also noted below. So if, the, again, last chance, hit the like button, <laughs> subscribe. I've got some of the future programs listed below if you'd like to hit the notify button so you'll be reminded. And then join Patreon. It's only five bucks a month. It's been nice talking to you.